family is, has always been crazy for Christmas. We love the holiday, all the manifestations, both religious and secular, we love them. We have lots of traditions that have been handed down from my, as far as I know back, my great grandparents. So some of them are, we always go to 11 o'clock uh, Christmas Eve church service. We um, uh, are Methodists. Um, generations of Methodists, and if you know Methodists, we love to sing. We love to sing loudly, and we love to sing um, off-key, and that's so perfectly okay. So Christmas hymns are a real, and singing Christmas hymns and a, a real part of our traditions. Um, the family, we always, for generations, Christmas weekend, we go out, we cut a tree, and we decorate it so that by that Monday, our houses are filled with the smell of balsam, and we love that. And then like most families at Christmas and holidays, food is really important. So there's still lots of recipes that have been handed down from my great grandmother. So there's cookies and candies and pastries that, we, that many of us still cook. And we keep adding to them along the way. Um, I married a Methodist minister. And so I wound up having Christmas on steroids. Besides <laughs> family, I had Christmas pageants and Christmas open houses and, and Christmas cookie exchanges. and so. I still baked and baked even more at that point. About 17 years um, into our marriage, we decided to separate. And there's a term that's been used in the last couple of weeks that I really like. It's called conscious uncoupling. It was very mm -hmm. amicable and we remained friends. And then a few years later, my kids um, grew up and left home. So all of a sudden, I was a single person. And as a single person, you don't really like to cook. It's cooking for one's really not a whole lot of fun. And so I didn't. Um, and so all of a sudden, people who knew me from that point on didn't really know that I cooked or I baked or anything like that, except for my family. My family always knew that at Christmas time, at least, they were going to get the cakes and cookies and pastries and all of that kind of stuff. Um, my house is 100 years old. It's relatively small. So I don't have a lot of storage. If you know old houses, they don't have lots of closet space. And so my stove became um, a place to store things. I had Christmas paper, especially the, not the long rolls, but the, the ones that were squares, Christmas decorations. And later on, copy paper boxes would really fit in there really well. <laughs> so when people came to my house, they just, they just knew that that's what was going to be in my kitchen. Except for Christmas. I would always take the week off before Christmas and get my shopping done and my wrapping, and then I would start to bake. Of course, I would have to empty out the stove I'd have to go into my cupboard and see what was left over and expired from last year. So I'd make my little list that I'd go and I'd start cooking and start baking. And so what I want to tell you about is a particular Christmas, Christmas 2010. I had my tree up, um, music was blaring, and when I cook, I like to listen to Christmas, loud Christmas music. And on this particular day, the Messiah was blaring through the house. Um, I had baked um, all the things that I needed to bake, the cookies, they were all ready to go. It was Christmas Eve, um, 11 o'clock, I was going to join my brother and family for Christmas Eve service. My daughter was going to come over and join us at, that, at, at church. And so this was about maybe 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And the very last thing I always bake at Christmas is a Christmas coffee cake that my great-grandmother had, her recipe. And I was starting, I was cooking. and. To this day, I do not know what happened. I have no clue what happened. I was cooking, and then I wasn't. The first thing I remember is my head, um, hearing the crack of my head on the ceramic floor, I fell. And warm moisture st was started flowing. And I, uh, I, I've got to, I'm, 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 I'm hurt. And then I realized that I had fallen into the side of the oven, and I couldn't move my right arm. So I'm laying there, I think, no one's going to be looking for me till at least 11 o'clock, so I've got to do something. And I looked up, and on the side of my stove hung a, a magnet that held Christmas pot holders. So I grabbed a Christmas pot holder with a great big poinsettia on it and stuck it on my head to stop the bleeding. I sort of got over to my haunches, grabbed my right arm with my left, and then tried to figure out what was my next move. Well, I could see my house phone but I couldn't quite reach it. But I could see my cell phone. So I reached over to the counter, grabbed my cell phone. And I don't know why, but I called my daughter, who lives 20 miles away, and said, hey, I've gotten hurt. I need some help. I'll be right there. So then I thought, that was really dumb. I need to call 911. So I dialed 911 
told them what had happened, and they said they would be right there. So I managed to get up on my, on my knees, and I thought, I got, I've got to get up here. Um, I could, now, I continued to be around Methodist Church because the Methodist Church is right next to my house. And the ambulance, the emergency services are across the street on the other side. I could hear the ambulance driving around, but they weren't coming to my house. <laughs> so I thought, hmm, now I was beginning to think I was gonna pass out. So I went out on the porch and sat on the side porch. Potholder's now <laughs> dried blood stuck to my head. And I was sitting there and thinking, Luckily, I put my cell phone in my pocket, and I realized that the, the only way emergency um, services back then could find you was really they were tied into your home phone. So I got, dialed them again and told them where I was, and they said they would be right there. And I started to sit, and I could hear someone pull up, and I heard, what the hell happened to you? And it was my daughter, and right then the emergency squad arrived. So they came up, and they realized they were gonna to need to take me to the hospital. They put me on a stretcher, got me into the ambulance. And the paramedic and I were talking and she had just give, had given me some um, uh, morphine. And we heard this loud commotion outside the ambulance. And the two men who had driven the ambulance were having an argument about who was gonna to have to take me to Saratoga Hospital because they both had Christmas Eve dinner on the table. And I swear, I, I, this, is not, this is absolutely true. They did rock, paper, scissors to decide who was gonna to have to take me. The paramedic said, I'm a woman, I can multitask, but you guys are going to have to take care of this. So off we go. I arrive at the emergency room. My daughter was behind me. She came in with her boyfriend. She had called my brother, um, who uh, lives in Middle Grove, and um, they, were going to, they were on their way to the hospital. So they had taken me in for a CAT scan and uh, realized that I had, didn't have a skull fracture. I was, you know, they were going to have to kind of do something about the arm, but they, I could go home. All of a sudden, I heard a commotion, and the curtains parted, and there was Santa Claus standing in front of me <laughs> with a little elf. <laughs> now, I'd forgotten, and my brother, is a, he's the fire chief in Middle Grove, and on Christmas Eve, they, a lot of the guys get together, and my brother plays Santa Claus. So he had arrived in full Santa regalia with his glasses and everything, and they um, said that I could go home later on, so he said, I'm going to go play Santa Claus. And my sister-in-law, who is four foot ten, she was the little elf. And they were going to come back and take me to their house. And so I told them, we have horses, and so I told my daughter, go take care of the horses. I'll see you in the morning. We'll, you know, we all have Christmas breakfast together. That would be fine. So I lay there, and um, I don't know how long it was. They were sort of bandaging me up, and they had taken the potholder off my head. That was a, a, a subject of great um, uh, discussion. And uh, because it had dried the blood to my head. And all of a sudden, I heard singing. And the tune was, Here Comes Santa Claus. And I looked up, and the hospital personnel, doctors and everybody, were singing, Here Comes Santa Claus, because here came my brother and the elf again, coming, and they had jingle bells, and they were coming through the emergency room to take me home. <laughs> so they took me home, and... I sat on their recliner. I stayed there in the morning, all, all night. And then my family arrived in Christmas morning. And there I was. I still had dried blood caked on my head. The potholder was gone. Um, but there I was. And I was having a black and blue eye that was coming all the way down here. And, and I was pretty high on oxycodone and whatever, and kind of out of it. And then I realized that my daughter had taken my photograph and put it on Facebook because <laughs> All of a sudden, my phone that was sitting next to me started buzzing and buzzing and buzzing and buzzing. And the Facebook texts were, what was Carol cooking? Why was she in the kitchen? She doesn't cook. What's, what's going on? This is ridiculous. And so for the last two Christmases, we now have a new tradition in my house, in my personal house. Um, there are two. One, I have to start, every time I'm in the kitchen now cooking at Christmas, I have to put on Facebook pictures of what I'm cooking and selfies to make sure that people know that I'm perfectly okay and that I've, been, that I've made it through Christmas. Then the second tradition is now my brother, or my, the aide on the local fire chief, and now every Christmas Eve, the local fire chief calls me at 4 o'clock and wants to know if it's okay for him to go have Christmas dinner. <laughs>